afternoon, everyone. So is it just me or have the last few years been really, really tough? Um, please, raise your hands if it's been tough for you. So it's everyone who share this, right? Uh, thank you. I'm not afraid to say that it's been really tough for me, personally, professionally, and socially. And to all of us who have lost and mourned, my condolences, and I hope it gets better. Dear attendees here at the Knowledge Equity Network, Global Summit at Leeds University, hashtag Ken 2022 if you're online or if you're sitting in the room, please. Social media. Hello to the online viewers around the world. Welcome streamers, <laughs> listeners, friends and all. We are emerging from what has been a communally experienced tragedy. And I characterize it here as an experience that we all shared. However, it was an experience that created a hyper sense of loneliness. Um, and it seems to have set up a much more pronounced sense of being an individual. Sadly, for many of us, it's also manifested in our disconnecting from the community. Maybe it's a loss of sharing in humanity. In academic research, we often motivate students and researchers to imagine a golden thread running through their writing. It can be a short strand, like a meaning or a point connecting two paragraphs and making half a page of a clearly set out meaning. It could be a series of chapters set into a compilation that presents a perspective shared by many, told using various devices. It could be a thesis, tightly defining and describing one particular element. Here, granular details and varying vantage points combine and connect to clarify and depict a core element the author or speaker wants to share. Like me, here, today, now. It's a line that connects things. It's a connecting strand that helps to build upon what's come before and may come after by making direct connections between elements, right? This golden thread helps us to be part of an argument or statement and to further the essential meaning they have when they are put together. To me, that connection here is us. It's people. Not a me, not an I, but a we. It's an us. Today, I want to turn me and you into we and speak about us. I'm from the Open Education Influences Project at Nelson Mandela University. It's a student advocacy through action, empowerment program that innovates education through action. I live in South Africa and I am an African. And we share a philosophy with others as a way to describe and motivate a shared perspective as a community-based understanding of the value of a society facing life. Do you know what it is? Yes. What? Ubuntu. There are many understandings of Ubuntu out there, and many are a derivative, watered-down version of an essential meaning. I am because we are. Hmm, it's lovely. At this point, I want to pause as I paint a picture. You can close your eyes and listen to my voice, but otherwise, just watch and listen, right? Picture a watering hole in the middle of an African bush felt. Think a movie landscape if you haven't been to Africa. I mean, I live there, I see this every day. A wilderness landscape with a beautiful, imperfect loop of water surrounded by a brief expanse of wet and sandy shore. Visualize croppings of brown grasses fluttering in a dry breeze, right? And the occasional thorny bush shown up with a leafy tree. Gently, waves lap at the water's edge, where animals of all kinds are gathered to drink from the source. In your vision, let's only focus on the elephant, the lion, some mammals, and a few insects, all at the water's edge. And that's where we are now, right? The water's edge. Of course, each animal has their own way of drinking, of consumption. The elephant's sip is big, reaching far into the fresh, flowing water. And when its trunk takes a big gulp, the water level actually recedes. That means that some of the smaller animals need to move forward to reach the new water's edge. In front of them, newly exposed though, that soil is wet, it's muddy. There's a fear of treading on this new ground. And as the elephant drinks, he's full and steps back to move towards that tree 
Water filled some of the footprints it leaves behind. The smaller animals rush towards these pools and start to drink. For some of them, these are crater-like pools of water. But the water's brown and it's muddy and the edges of the pool often cave in and some of the smaller animals fall in and drown. Hmm. But thirst prevails and the surviving animals keep drinking murky water which is now littered with some dead bodies. Now the dark side. Remembering how fresh and clean its drink was though, the elephant reaches into a huge tree and tears off a branch. The branch is well selected and it's one with many stems. The stems reach out like arms and all along at the ends they have twigs which act like fingers. Hundreds of fingers and then thousands of leaves. Hmm. The elephant walks back to the water and places the branch on the shore. With the branch now a bridge from the sand and reaching into the water. The stems act as walkways for the smaller animals. The twigs become jetties and keys and the leaves act as docking spaces for the smallest animals to sit, rest and drink from fresh and flowing clean water. Across the way, the lion is roaring. Hmm. But more and more, the once fearful animals see another route to the fresh water. They see others drinking, and now instead of running away, those others come nearer and step onto the stem. If you haven't already, you can open your eyes now. I don't want you to spend the rest of the time sitting like this. <laughs> so when I received the invitation to be part of Ken, and to help support and motivate the realization of the Ken Declaration in my own small and humble way. I was immediately struck by the realization that lots of declarations about good wishes and good deeds and good intentions exist. Think Dakar, think Ljubljana, the European Commission, Berlin, Budapest, Paris, Cape Town, just as some example amongst a plethora of others. What really triggered me was that all too often these statements and plans were co-created and led by people who really didn't have first-hand knowledge in their current spaces of the real reality that needed to be changed and the ways it needed to change so that these declarations reached the ground and had an impact. Hmm. They set out ways that they would do so and that others should adopt. So maybe I was going to be emerging in a landscape of dreams here at Ken. Hmm. It was an anxiety provoking realization I needed to engage and then overcome. So now I'm telling tales. And let me pause here and ask a question. And this might sound familiar from earlier on. What's the difference between a dream and a hope? Take a few seconds and think hard. What is the difference between a dream and a hope? I'm going to be a provocation for thought, like I was asked to be and try to lead you to consider these points as I complete my talk. I'm, I'm almost there. Remember, you all have a chance to share your considerations, so I'm just going to put these provocations out there. It's a set of six questions okay, or statements. Provocation one, the declaration for many may at, come, at times come across as a dream. If you read one of the aims of enabling global practices in the declaration, it says, working with signatories will deliver a step change in global approaches to higher education, including a move away from competition focused rankings. Hmm. Think about the elephant. If we think of the storytelling analogy, does that mean the elephant's the same as the smaller animals and the insects then? Moving away from these rankings. Are larger institutions going to be willing to share and support at the same time and let go of being the big player in the field? Provocation two. The knowledge equity network itself to me is the hope. The hope is all of us in this room. It's you online, right? Or watching as a recording. It is you, so what will you do is the question to think about as we go ahead. You should take this dream and make it real. Provocation three, the lion is still roaring. Lead by example, share what you want to do, what you are doing and have done. Share how and help others get closer. Provocation four, what role will students play in your engagement in this network? And how will you empower them into spaces where their voices are heard, but meaningfully so, not just because they're students and you want to have them as part of the conversation. Provocation five, to all of these stakeholders in this room and online and watching, 
Understand what open education is. Do you know the terminology? Have you done the homework before you're telling other people what they should do? Number six, if you help the smaller animals get to and then drink water, do they owe you something? Is the bigger animal the boss? Does its help cost the smaller animal something? Uh, Prof Freshwater said this morning, and uh, she said, someone bears the cost, but should it be the smaller animals? So I end up asking, are you the elephant? Are you one of the smaller animals? Are you the lion in the field of open? Prof Batendijk spoke about the generosity of larger institutions. And if you don't get it still, they are the elephants in the story. Prof Cooper spoke about publishers and the mechanisms they use to scale away progress at times in the pursuits of us all opening up. The global south is not the only space with smaller animals. This is not location based. Lots of people need help to open up. So how are we doing this? At Nelson Mandela University, our byline is change the world. And the Knowledge Equity Network needs us, that's you and I, to do just that. Think about it, and then let's talk about opening up with hope after Cardin Salt, um, Salt speaks next. Thank you. <laughs>